You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on KLOS. Um, yeah, what's what's going on? It's uh, it's twelve sixteen on a Monday. It's beautiful out. <laughs> love the rain, love the rain, man. That was a uh, that was a uh, coat vial. Check baby was the name of that track, and before that was Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, Jubilee Street. And today, my man, Mike Garson, is on the box with me. How are you, buddy? It's good to be here with you again. Um, is it your volume all right? Do you want me to adjust the volume? I'm fine. You don't want it loud or... Well? I hear you perfectly. Because he can't get in the way because he's got a piano in front of him. <laughs> um, so, uh, you're doing some more shows? Yeah. It's a Bowie celebration, and we have 33 shows starting uh, day after tomorrow in Mesa. We'll be in L.A. at the Orpheum, actually, this Thursday. At the Orpheum, downtown. On the uh, 7th, and then we go over to Pachanga on the 8th, and Cerritos on the 9th. Yeah. Then we continue through the whole country. Yeah. And is it successful? It just came back from Europe. Was just, this is the best band that I've had. We had Earl Slick who was obviously with David since 74, and we had Mark Platty, who was a producer of Earthling and Ours, playing guitar, and we had Carl Martin Rojas, you might know him, he yeah. did Let's Dance, and all that, he was with us and myself. And then Earl Slick's son is playing drums, very talented, and he yeah. studied with one of the Bowie drummers, Sterling, so he sounds great. And three amazing singers, we have Bernard Fowler, who you know from the Rolling Stones, he would have been here today, but he had a doctor's appointment, and we have Corey Glover from Living Color. Oh, he, yeah? He's killing it. And uh, on this, in L.A., we'll have Gabby Marino and Joe Sumner. Evan Rachel Wood is going to sing two songs with us. She loves to join join and sing with us. She's she done it before, right? She's done it before. And uh, it's a lovely band. It's, it's the best one so far, and we're expanding the uh, repertoire, let's put it that way. Yeah. You know? We're actually doing Sweet Thing and Candidates from the Diamond Dogs oh, days. Yeah. And we never did that. And Bernard is singing Win, which he sounds so beautiful. Yeah. Like. Plus a lot of the regular hits. And uh, Does he have a nice lead voice, Bernard? He does. I was so pleasantly surprised when we met. You know, he sounds great. He's a terrific front man, too. Oh. Really happy to see that. Okay. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Did you watch the... Uh Super Bowl yesterday? I did. What did you think? Were you rooting for the well, Rams? I didn't have much of a preference. My grandson is a big Boston fan, so he was he was rooting in the World Series for Boston, and he was rooting yesterday for, for Boston. And I think his intention was stronger than all of L.A. because they won. Yeah. Did you watch it? I did. I watched it, too. What would you think? I thought it was a boring game. It was. And dull. But you know what? They had a couple of opportunities to take it, the Rams. They did. A couple of long throws, and mm -hmm. the blokes must have had oil on their gloves or something. Cause Slid right off, I saw that. Just fumbled it. That 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 really long one, the one was like, yeah. all, you know. I saw if he would have caught that, it would have been a different story. Would have been a different story. I like the little bit of chest near the end that they were playing. Yeah. You know, that was that was good, but it, it, was, a, it was a bore, and I thought the, I thought the halftime... Entertainment was a bit of a, a bit of a dud too, to be honest with you. Yeah, the um, it was the lowest scoring. Yeah, Super Bowl ever. Because supposedly, f from the from the money people, they were saying you could have bet on there's going to be a lot of goals. Uh, what not called? They're not called goals. What are they called in American football? Touchdowns. Touchdowns. Yeah, they was they were saying it was going to be a lot, and it was actually. What do they know? It was the opposite. It was the opposite. But I had fun watching it with a bunch of people. Yeah, it was a nice distraction. I just got back two days ago from Europe, so it was nice to uh, yeah to watch it. I didn't also mention, you know, who's joining us on this American tour? Charlie Sexton. Oh, yeah. Uh, from Austin. Yeah, and he's just finishing a tour with Dylan just right. last week, so he'll be with us for this next uh, two months. And uh Looking forward uh, to both his guitar playing and singing. Is he going to sing some yeah, songs? Yeah, he's going to sing a bunch of songs. He's got a good voice. He does have a good voice. Do you remember him when he first came out? In yeah. the 80s with that piece? Beat So Lonely. Beat, yeah, 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 yeah. On that on, uh, on MC, MCA yeah. label. 
and uh, what was his name? The guy who produced uh, Billy Idol produced him. Uh, oh, it's killing me. All the hits he had early early on uh, was by the guy. Um, never mind. He's he's gonna be a a big asset to the band. I'm looking forward to having him. <laughs> <laughs> He was a good-looking dude. Is he still oh good-looking? I'll let you know in two days. I yeah. haven't seen him, but boy, was he handsome. He sang with David Bowie in Australia. They did the Lou Reed song, White Light, White Heat. Oh, yeah. And the two of them together was so handsome, and they were singing, and just was amazing. So we might add that in the show tomorrow. He's going to meet us in Mesa, Arizona, uh, and then we'll see how he sounds. Yeah. I think it was that Keith Forsey. Keith Forsey was the producer. I believe it just came in, entered it's my head. To, that's good. Anyway, he, uh, I remember uh, I was on the same label with him. I had a solo record. But Charlie, I don't think, wanted to be a pop star. It didn't feel comfortable with him, even though he looked like a pop, you know, like that's a, interesting. a star. He didn't like being the front guy. Really? Yeah. He was, yeah. Well, it probably is true because it didn't happen, did it? Yeah, exactly. But, but he's been with Dylan for, he's done many tours with Dylan. He's been with Dylan since 98 or 99. Yeah. And interestingly enough, around that period, David Bowie asked him to join us, but he had just joined Dylan. Oh, man. So he's had this desire and regret for a long time, and now this is going to be the closest going to get to work with. Yeah. I mean, I have some good ideas with him and Earl Slick trading off on yeah. Gene Genie and yeah. we'll, two blues players and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that'd be good. Is he going to be? He's not going to be a. He'll be in LA at the Orpheum with us. Oh, he is? Yep. Ah. Uh. Yep. He'll be on the whole American tour, all 33 shows. Charlie. Charlie, yeah. Can you get me in? Of course. Like the full Monty? Everything you want, full access. Okay. <laughs> Please come. Let's, should we play some music? Let's play a bit of uh, David Bowie. Let's spend the night together from the album Aladdin Sane. We're here with my guest, Mike Garson. Oh, I remember that solo. You, yeah, you're all over this. Yeah. Jonesy's Jukebox K. <laughs> you're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox and Carol OS my guest Mike Garson and um, that was uh, Mick Ronson White Light White Heat from, yeah. from the album uh, Play Don't Worry Play Don't Worry yes and you that's you on the old ivories like I said I hadn't heard that track for 40 some odd years it sounds good though right it sounds great it sounds great and then before that was uh, David Bowie Let's Spend the Night Together from Aladdin Sane yeah. which that was also you on piano I was very blessed to work with great players. When you, I know, you, I don't know if you remember this, but when you did the Mick Ronson thing, that was obviously after the Bowie thing. Right. The spiders collapsed, right? Exactly. Ended. Do you remember being in the studio? Did you, is that just like an overdub or was you in there, you wasn't in there live with Mick Ronson? I was. Cutting that live? I was, I was there for both of his albums, for all of it. Yeah. It wasn't even overdubs. I played with him and hung with him because we were close friends. And uh, I separated the fact that he was done with David or David was done with him for that period of time. Yeah. 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 And uh, was there animosity? With, with there was a little bit of a loss for the Spiders because... Uh, they didn't know what hit and they, they weren't expecting They didn't that. expect it. But I think separate from whatever personal things might have been going on, David just had to um, spread his wings. That's what I realized through the years. And he had to just keep changing. And not a lot of people know this, but those first two years that I worked with him from 72 to 74, he actually fired five bands. I was the only one that remained because, and it wasn't because of friendship, even though we were friends, it was I could change styles with him. So what he wanted, gospel, I could do that, or avant-garde, or jazz, or pop. But, you know, English musicians there at the time, they weren't able to do the young American stuff. So he was just looking for different people. So it really wasn't personal. That was his MO. That was his MO. He's always changing the uh, hats. Yeah, there were albums that he didn't need me or want me, and wanted Eno, wanted a minimalist thing. Naturally, you feel bad, but I never took it personally because I knew he was hearing something else in his head, you know? Yeah, and I guess the fact that they didn't understand it, it was because they were getting more popular, the right. Spiders, right? right. You know, they, they was at the, to at the top of their game. 
and, and then all of a sudden, it's over. It was over. And then they were just like working class dudes, and they probably thought, what the hell's going on here? But they were getting screwed anyway. They were getting royally screwed. Yeah. So he did them a favor, really. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that was... Uh, I love that. I love them. That, them that that period of Bowie. It was know? a great period, right? Because he was trying for a long time before that, but no one ever knew him. That's when, right. When he had the knew. long, curly hair and the dresses and the whatnots. Nobody knew him. And even in even back earlier, when he was uh, dressed like a mod. I know. You know. They weren't particularly great songs and it right. just wasn't there yet until he hit Space Oddity and yeah. Man Who Sold the World and yeah. he found it you know sometimes you have to experiment you know yeah. because he was such a chameleon, chameleon we'd be rehearsing sometimes and all of a sudden he starts to sound like Johnny Cash right. or he'd do Elvis I right. mean he just had that gift yeah. but he also had his own voice obviously yeah mm -hmm. Anthony Newley Anthony Newley was one of his heroes I mean he really did copy him vocally he did? Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. He also copied Annette Peacock, who was a avant-garde singer from New York. She's the one who told him about me. And she did a song called I'm the One. And he, Mick Ronson loved her and David loved her. And you could even hear in his voice Annette Peacock, who's a female singer. Yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you remember? I had um, Andy Kramer on last week. You know who he is? He, Remind me. He was a Hendrix. Eddie Kramer. Eddie Kramer, sorry. Oh, Eddie. I know Eddie. Yeah, yeah. He, he was on last week. And we were talking about, he produced uh, Jabriath's album. Do you remember a guy called Jabriath in New York? I don't think Very I Very kind of glammy. I didn't know that. I just knew the Jimmy stuff. He also produced an album with a band I was with called Brethren. And I used to go over to Electric Lady and we'd play four hands together because he's a piano player. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, no, I don't know that other artist, no. Yeah. He was a, a, a trained pianist, too. He's very good on, on keyboards. Jabriaf. He died of AIDS. Oh, jeez. But he was a... He, it's a beautiful album. I've, I've got the album. I think, I'll uh, have to look it up. Yeah. Um, should we play some more music? Let's play some Cockney Rebel. Yeah, I love Steve Harley, and he's always joining me when I'm in England. Yeah. Great. Well, we're here with Mike Garson, Jonesy's Jukebox, KLOS. This is Cockney Rebel what Rufy said. You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox, KLOS, with my guest, Mike Carson. And that was David Bowie. That was a rebel, rebel, sweet thing reprise, sweet thing candidate. And then before that, we had uh, Jabriath, Space Clown, and Cockney Rebel, what Rufy said. Um, they play a lot of good music on here, Steve. Yeah. I love it. Um, so he was talking about, I, I, I think it's pretty common knowledge that Bowie played the guitar on Rebel Rebel. He did. Was he any good as a guitar player? He had a vibe. Yeah. I can't explain it. Even when he played the piano on Pretty Things on the top of the Pops the first time they really became big, that was him on piano. So everything he did was simple but very pointed and focused. Yeah. And you could tell he was magical. You know? Did he come up with that riff? I think he did. That's a good riff. It's a great riff. That's like something a guitar player would come up with. Yeah. He loved and the guitar. How was he on the sax? He was fair, but again, very creative. Uh, especially the baritone sax, the real big one. He loved playing that. Yeah. We would play gigs in Europe and then go over to raves after, and they wouldn't know we were playing. We would just do instrumental, and he'd be on baritone. Yeah. Yeah. He, he had a good sound. I liked the sound of his uh, sax playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did he play on the Lulu version? Remember Lulu did... Um, I recorded with her on that, on Man Who Sold the World. Yeah. I think so. It yeah. sounds like him. He has a... He's a musical person. I yeah. mean, he was so, so musical. Yeah. You know? Yeah. He didn't have much talent, though, other than that. No, it was all PR. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we need to go to the Duke? Yeah. we got to go to the Duke. When we come back, Mike's got his uh, piano here, and we're going to do some uh, some stuff live. Yeah. See you then. You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on KLOS with my guest Mike Garson. That was the Kinks Shangri-La from the album Arthur, 
1969. Then we had Jimi Hendrix, Castle Made of Sand, and uh, Bada Boom Bada Bing. Mikey, baby. How are you? Ready to play a little music. Yeah? Yeah. So we're just going to kind of, this is what, we've done this before, right? We just kind of noodle. Just, just noodle around. Noodle around. But we are going to give some uh, tickets away to the show that's this Thursday in a little while. Is it this Thursday? Yes, Thursday night. At the, the Orpheum. Orpheum. Yeah. And we got a box set as well, a Bowie, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. But we're going to be giving a lot I of stuff I think it's away. the uh, Glastonbury, and uh, that's, they put out a CD and DVD of that from 2000. Yeah. And then also, I think, a Loving the Alien box set. Yeah. It's all right. Can't beat the price. That's right. Okay, here we go. Hold on a sec. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on Carl OS. That was Roxy Music, Beauty Queen, from the album For Your Pleasure. Then we had David Bowie Time from the album Aladdin Sane. And we're here with my guest, Mike Garson, who played uh, piano on all them. Not the Roxy Music, but... No, I was out with David with the Spiders at the same time. Yeah. We were competitors. Yeah. Um, nevertheless... Two of my favorite bands. You have good taste. Yeah. I know my stuff. I know you do. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna we're gonna do it we're gonna give away the box sets right now. Um is there info on it somewhere? I know this I'm covered in paper here. Uh, I think one was the Loving the Alien that came out recently. They redid some of the stuff from the eighties. Yeah. And then the D V D C D from Glastonbury from two thousand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the number is one eight hundred nine five five KLOS, but not so fast, peopleoids. You got to call in and guess what this piano part is. It's an interim. It's an. It's the beginning of a song, and if you get it right, and you call a number twenty five, you will be lucky enough to get this box set. So we're going to visit the Duke. No, we're not. He's going to play the piano. Take it away, Mikey baby. To Jonesy's jukebox, Carl OS. That was Martin the Hoople, the golden age of rock and roll. You didn't play on that, did you? No, but I remember when he joined us in with uh, David, and we did all the all old the dudes, young dudes in '72 uh, or three. Yeah, you didn't play on that either, did you? Not that version. Many other versions. Yeah, yeah. Then we had Woody Woodmansy when he had a band called U Boat. That's right. And uh, that song was called U-Boat, yeah? yeah? And then we had Lulu, The Man Who Sold the World, which was a hit in England, right? Number one hit. Number one that you're playing on. Playing on that, yeah. Um, if you're wondering who I'm talking to, I'm talking to Mike Garson, long-time keyboardist for David Bowie. Many, many shows you've played on. Over a thousand yes. with Bowie? Yes, 20 albums. Incredible. Um, then we had David Essex, <laughs> Gonna Make You a Star. You didn't play on that. I'm on one of his albums, and I don't remember which yeah. one. It's only like 47 years ago. I don't remember what I had for breakfast today. Yeah, we were scrambling around looking for something. That was the best I could come up with. That was a hit in England. I remember that one. And then we had Aerosmith, Toys in the Attic. That was for the uh, the 5K doodah. Yeah. Do I have to say anything else about that? No. Nah. Okay. Um, all right. So, Thursday, the 7th of February, at the Orpheum Theatre, downtown LA, a Bowie celebration, the David Bowie Alumni Tour. That's this Thursday, Friday, the 8th, at the, I can't even read that, Pepeng... Pachanga? Achanga Hunga Hunga Resort in Temecula. It's a good casino to lose your money in. Yeah, I lost 200 bucks yesterday. And I didn't even go to a casino. <laughs> I, I bet on the uh, the Rams. Oh, just just a just just, just a, a, a gentleman's bet. That's fine. Saturday, February the 9th at Cerrito Center. That's a nice concert hall. Very mm. nice. And then the entire U.S. tour continues through March in the states. All through the all through the states through March 22nd. Yeah. I don't know if a lot of people know this, but you lost your house in the Walsley fire, yeah? Yeah, I did. And you lost all his, all his gear, all his gear. So if uh, if uh, Guitar Center's listening, <laughs> he could do with some free stuff. <laughs> Would you accept free stuff? We're okay. We're okay. Just as long as I have some water. Water? 
<laughs> oh man. Um so that's it, right? Anything else I've got to say? I've got 50 pieces of paper in front of me. Um, that's it. Oh, yeah. Tomorrow, we've got Andy McCluskey of Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark at 12. And at 1 o'clock, we've got Craig Ferguson. You know him from the Late Late Show. Yeah, he's great. And then Thursday, we've got actor-comedian Matt Walsh from the show Veep and The Daily Show. So, uh, have a good rest of your day. Why don't you let us out with a bit of cabaret uh, lift music, cabaret? Ele elevator music? <laughs> I can do that for you. I should, I should have, yeah, I should have done it over there. Okay. Stay away from that 405, people. It's a jungle out there. Oh, it's raining cats and dogs. The one-on-one is moving. Downtown LA. Jive Turkey. It's a beautiful thing being on the box with my guest, Mike Garson. He's leading me out on his Joanna. What a guy. Listen to that guy. Nice. Rock and roll, baby. <laughs> Coming at you. See you later.